we thought it would be a nice idea to take a look back at the top business stories of the last seven days and what a tumultuous week it's been. To help us pick through it all, I'm joined by my fellow money talkers, TRT World's editor-at-large, Craig Capetus in Paris, and senior business producer, Andre Pierre Duplessis, we spoke about just now. We've also had tourism numbers out this week. And once again, the headline figure was disappointing. A 6.5% drop in February compared to the same month last year. But there was a silver lining. The Russians are back. Arrivals from there almost doubled last month. But when we take a longer term view, it is clear to see the damage that last year's coup and terror attacks have had on this important sector. Tourism accounts for 13% of Turkey's GDP and employs 8% of the workforce. So, Taha, let's turn now to these uh, tourism numbers. OK. Um, again, were these a surprise? Uh, I think they were, these were not a surprise, as much as uh, the GDP numbers were, frankly. Um, the one silver lining was the, the, uh, the, 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 the spike between the, with the Russian arrivals. They increased by 95% uh, year, year over year, so mm. February of, of 2016 versus 2017. So that was great news. Um, but the rest of the numbers, there's no way to sugarcoat it, frankly. There's just a, a real slowdown. Um, and it makes sense because people are wary of, of the future of, of the government, of, of the country, rather. And especially with uh, what happened last summer, um, I think people will, will get over it, but it'll take time. Yeah, indeed. Uh, political factors, of course, very important in this particular sector. Right. Um, as we go into this peak summer season for tourism, uh, how do you think this season is going to do compared to last year? I think last year was almost was, was the perfect storm for tourism, so it's going to def def definitely do better than last year. But how much better it will be is a question mark. And... Uh, it depends on how the uh, how the people and the government can t can put an end to any tense tensions between Europe and Turkey and Europe and uh, Turkey and Russia rather have been have been pretty much uh, patching things up. So I don't think there should be a problem in that yeah, respect. Yeah, it, it is interesting. I mean, like you know, some of the traders and everything that we've spoken to uh, in you know the Grand Bazaar and right. pa places like that, they've just basically written last year <laughs> off right. and they're looking forward to this year. Um, we know that the Turkish government is taking steps to revive the tourism industry. They have this Bring Your Neighbour campaign, which is a very innovative way of, right. of trying to boost numbers. Right. Um, but again, though, we have had this row with Germany and with Netherlands. Right. How's that going to play into all of this? You know, I think people will, will understand that there's, there are elections in France, there's elections in Germany uh, this year, and there were just elections in the Netherlands. So a lot of this is politics, frankly. And I think uh, as soon as those elections uh, come up and are dealt with, then uh, you know, everyone wants to have a great time. And you know, everyone wants to go to the beach and <laughs> hang out. So I think they'll, they'll come around. And I think there will be a return, especially at the lowest, at, this, uh, at the value of the Turkish lira. I think we'll have a lot of tourists return this summer. And what lovely beaches we have. Yeah, that's right. Let me turn to Craig in Paris. Craig, thanks so much for being with us. Um, now, France, of course, suffered two major terrorist attacks in, Fra in Paris and in Nice. And we did see tourism numbers taking a hit in France as well. But things have recovered to a, at least some extent. What lessons, if any, can Turkey learn from how France dealt with that impact? Aggressive enforcement, preventive maintenance, uh, 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 an aggressive marketing campaign, which is what the French did. Uh, but make no mistake about it, the uh, tourist numbers down here are, in France are, are, are still quite low. You can uh, find hotels here at great rates. Uh, the situation down in the south on the beaches is not that good. Uh, and the fear that everyone here has is that if there is one more, then this whole cycle will, will start over again. One of the uh, things we've seen is an increased presence of armed troops on the streets. And this is something that, you know, you come to Paris, people don't like to see it, but it's the way of life now. Indeed, it is a necessary evil. The big elephant in the room now, though, of course, is Brexit. British Prime Minister Theresa May has told the EU that the UK wants to leave and the two-year countdown for the most complicated divorce in history is underway. 
And now the ball is in the EU's court. The European Council President, Donald Tusk, said the UK will not be able to immediately launch into bilateral trade talks with EU member states. He said other issues, including an estimated $62 billion divorce bill to be paid by the UK, would have to be discussed as well. Tusk also stressed that the UK will remain under the jurisdiction of the European Court and that it may also have to accept the freedom of movement of people. But Tusk assured the UK that it would not be punished and that Brexit is punishment enough. Craig, let me stay with you now uh, on this. Uh, so Brexit moves into the European Forum. Um, in addition to what Donald Tusk said uh, over this week, I was actually quite interested in how he said it. I mean, on Wednesday, we heard him say he already misses the UK. And in the press conference that we had on Friday, he seemed defensive. What should we read into all of this? I have absolutely no idea, Azar. None whatsoever. Because what we've gone into now, we're down the road of rhetoric and soothsaying. And I prefer, going forward, to look at realities here, the old journalistic maxim. Don't tell me what you think, tell me what you see. And what we see here right now is the UK is the official poster country for EU incompetence, whether you want to accept the incompetence or not. If you want to see what the results of EU incompetence are, because they do exist, go to the EU theme park, Greece where you can fully experience the fecklessness of the Greek, uh, of what's happened down there to the Greeks. Let me go through this, because this is critical. 25% of all funds gutted from hospitals. 50% cuts in spending on drugs. A doubling in cases of major depression and a 33% rise in suicides. The number of stillborn babies up 21%. Four in 10 Greek children have now been shoved into poverty. And some surveys actually estimate, as are, that 54%, that's more than half of the Greek population, are now undernourished. That yeah. is what the EU has created. AP, uh, AP, I know you want to jump in here for a second. To ask Craig a question further to this, as a as an Greek American, um, so the way that the American media has portrayed the Brexit story across the pond this week is that this feels what uh, what uh, some people are calling the the Culex, California trying to exit from from all the other United States of, of America. Now, of course, if you speak to someone like Farage, he would be very happy to hear that. <laughs> What do you think? Does, is, is Brexit really just a foreboding of what we're going to see across the world as, as people even in South Africa stop believing in globalization? Yeah, great question. No, you're, you're, you're never going to see states seceding in the Union, despite what uh, EU President Jean-Claude Juncker said yesterday. You know, the man from Luxembourg, the country that made tax havens chic and fashionable, uh, said that if Donald Trump doesn't become more supportive of the EU, he's going to push for Ohio and Texas to leave the United States. Uh, this man is oblivious, and it points directly to this, to why Brexit happened. There is just a, dis a disconnection yeah. between the island and the continent on all sorts of policies. Yeah. Let's get let's and have this far, conversation. He, let's have this conversation again in two years, uh, <laughs> when we know whether Scotland is going to remain in the United Kingdom. Um, never, AP, never. <laughs> AP, I'm glad you brought up the issue of Nigel Farage because this was one of the uh, strangest stories I saw this week. Uh, now, the, Nigel Farage said this week that if Brexit is a disaster, and I'm quoting him. He says he will go and live abroad. Um, I'm wondering where he may possibly go. <laughs> is it going to be France? Is it going to be Turkey? Donald the Trump, US. Donald Trump <laughs> is welcome with, with open arms. arms yeah, he's, right. he's a big fan, right? Indeed. Oh, my goodness me. What <laughs> fascinating times in Texas. we're in.
So that was the week that was. Let's go around again very quickly and find out what's on everyone's radar for next week. Tal, let me start with you. Well, there's several very important uh, things happening next week. Uh, the uh, Egyptian president will be in Washington on Monday, and then on Thursday, the Chinese premier, Xi Jinping, will be meeting with Donald Trump. Trump made China one of his biggest uh, selling points in the election and said over and over that uh, we don't win again, we, have, we, we haven't won in a while, and the Chinese uh, currency manipulation will have to come to an end. So after they have their meeting at their press conference, let's see if he will walk the walk and really come back uh, to Xi Jinping and, uh, and let the people know that they're, they're really uh, fighting China on this currency Indeed, thing. Indeed, we're, we're going to be keeping a very close eye on that. Craig, what's happening in Europe? A busy week ahead over there. Well, yeah, everything in my patch of TRT world has to do with the French, upcoming French elections. And what we're focusing on is the uh, communist candidate, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who has overtaken the socialist candidate, Benoit Hamon, in the polls and is now stalking Francois Fillon. Uh, on top of that, recent uh, polls that we can trust say that 47 percent of the country doesn't, the voters don't know yet who they're going to vote for. So we're going to be looking at Mélenchon, whose two major economic policies are one, minimum 1,300 euros a month wage for all workers. And if you make more than 33,000 euros a month, he's going to tax you at 100 percent. Now, try to figure that out with a calculator, but that's what he's saying. <laughs> My goodness, haven't we seen all this before? And AP, what's on your mm. radar for next week? Well, on Wednesday, the very last Asterix comic book is going to be published or announced at least after 400 <laughs> million copies. And I know Craig is a big fan of Asterix. I grew up with it. it oh, huge, uh, huge. And it will be an interesting gauge to see how successful and how healthy the market for comic books still is. Oh, fantastic. I cannot wait. That's going to be my favourite story for next week. Taha Arvaz from the Daily Sabah, <laughs> Craig Capiz in Paris, and Andre Pierre Duplessis in Istanbul.